Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Hope for the Best, Plan for the Worst webinar. My name is Lucia, and I'm an events manager at CMI. I will shortly be handing over to David, who's running the session today. If you have any questions during the webinar, you can ask them using the live chat box on the right of your screen. We shall answer as many as we can. Today's session is being recorded, and it will be shared with you later on today. Now over to David, CHMC Assessment Manager at the Chartered Management Institute. Thanks, Lucia, and morning, everybody. Um, I want to talk today about crisis planning and how we can prepare for a crisis. But given that we've only got a short time together, I'm going to talk about a framework that we can use and a framework that we can use in a number of ways, including uh, using for personal crisis as well. So hopefully you'll find today's session interesting and informative. The key thing to think about when we're thinking about crisis is uh, is the famous words of Corporal Jones from Dad's Army, for anybody who remembers Dad's Army. And Corporal Jones used to run around shouting, don't panic, Captain Mannering, don't panic. And don't panic really is the key when we're thinking about crisis management. And when we're talking about crisis management, the key really is very much on management. Managing, managing the situation as best we can and managing the way we react to the situation as best we can as well, because that's the key to this. It's not necessarily how you manage external factors, it's how you manage your reaction to those external factors. So we're gonna talk a lot about that as we go through. When we think about a crisis, and as I said, you can think about this in terms of a personal crisis, you can think about it in terms of a team crisis, a whole organization crisis, or a wider crisis. Now, given the current situation that we're in across the world, I'm not by any means gonna to attempt to talk about how you would deal with a pandemic. Um, if I knew how you could do that successfully, I would be a very rich person and we wouldn't be in the state that we're in across the globe. So we're going to keep this to a framework to deal with crises that we can manage. However, that said, the framework, it gives you an idea of how it, you could scale this up to deal with a much bigger crisis as well. So when we think about it, there are three stages. There's what we call stage one, the pre-crisis. So this is before anything's happened. This is all about preparation. This is all about what can we do to mitigate any crisis that's likely to happen to us? And how can we reduce the, the effect of any crisis by pre-preparing for it? Once we've done that, we're going to look at stage two and the crisis itself. Now, when we look at stage two and, and, and how we deal with the crisis itself, this is really quite a lot smaller than the preparation stage. Because if you get the preparation stage right, it becomes a lot easier to deal with the crisis itself. And then a really important thing, and I often say this in my webinars, the really important thing is what happens afterwards. So we're going to talk about stage three and the aftermath. And this is an opportunity to reflect and look at what went well and what didn't go so well. So we're going to talk about that as well. So I hope you find this interesting. Um, at the end of this, we're going to direct you to some additional resources where you can find extra help and extra guidance. Um, but we're going to talk about the framework itself today. So stage one, the calm before the storm, if you like. Um, before anything happens, we need to be ready. And when we talk about crisis, it's, and it's really about anticipating crisis because this isn't about if it happens, this is about when it happens. Now, by having a framework like the one I'm talking about today, you can be prepared for anything that you can plug into it. So it can be a, a minor crisis, a, a medium-sized crisis, a personal crisis, or indeed a major crisis. But having that understanding of the framework and how you're going to deal with it is really important. So don't think about this in terms of the way we think about risk. When we think about risk, we think about if. If this happens, then this is what we'll do. Crisis management really is another step up. It's not about if, it's about when. And some people say to me, you know, what do I do about balancing how much time I spend preparing 
for the, the risk of something actually happening. Well, that's up to you. You need to think about that. But I would put a lot of time into the preparation stage that we're going to talk about. So when we think about a crisis, we, we, we've anticipated a crisis. We've built uh, our resilience to that by identifying a crisis teams. Who are our teams? Who are the people that need to be involved in helping us to get through this crisis? Why are they there? What do they bring to the, to the situation? Uh, are they experts? Are they additional resources in terms of bodies? If we're thinking about things like um, natural disasters, for example, you might be looking at additional resources in terms of psychological first aid. We've got our first aid teams there. We've got our first responders. We've got our firefighters. We've got our paramedics. But what often gets forgotten is the psychological effect. So we might want to build in a psychological team as well that can come in and offer some psychological first aid. Now, while we're talking about that in terms of a natural crisis, maybe a, you know, a forest fire or, a, or a, a, an earthquake or something terrible like that, we can also use that thinking within our team and within our organisation, scale it down, but the process really is the same. We need to understand who needs to come in, who needs to talk to people, who needs to do what and when they need to do it. We need to think about what those potential crises might be. You know, and we think about things that have happened and we say, well, no one saw it coming. Nobody could have identified it. And I always say, really, no one saw this coming or the people that saw it coming weren't listened to. And this is really important thing to take on board because in your organizations or in your, in your friend circles or wherever it might be, there will always be somebody who can see a potential crisis coming, can see it on the horizon and will talk about it. Now, the problem we have as human beings is we often choose to ignore that. So we will say, oh, you know, just let's look on the bright side. Let's carry on with it. What are the chances of that happening? Well, the chances of happening, it might be quite small, but the consequence of that happening could be huge, could be massive. You know, that's really what no one sees. When people say no one saw this coming, it's no one looked at the consequences rather than the potential of the crisis happening. One of the things that you can guarantee in life is at some point there will be a crisis. So when we say no one saw it coming, we don't need to prepare for that. I believe we do. Now, that's not to say this is looking at the dark side. This is a very positive approach to this because if we're ready and we've prepared, we can deal with it much better. If we think about the pandemic that, that we're currently in, there will be people that saw that coming. There will be scientists that knew what was going on. There will be people that, that will look back in 20 years time and quite easily say, yeah, I mean, that was obvious. We don't know at the moment, but that's what will happen in generations to come. And we know historically this is the case, because if we look back at, at uh, pandemics we've had in the past, we think about, you know, go back as far as bubonic plague if you want to. Um, look now at, at how we recognise that spreading, as opposed to how people at the time thought it spread. You look at cholera in London uh, in, in, the, um, in the 1800s, and people were still thinking it spread through the air, it spread through miasma, rather than it being uh, a virus or a, a germ that was spreading, spreading diseases. Um, and so when we look at it now, we think this is the worst thing in the world. But in 10 years time, we'll go, do you know what, we can learn from that. And that's the key. We have to learn from it. And we can know what we can do the next time around. So we've got things like the pandemic. We've got things like natural disasters, earthquakes, forest fires, as I mentioned earlier. But in terms of crisis, the more likely crisis that we're likely to face are going to be localised things. Things like strikes, things like boycotts, things like reputational damage. There was a, a company in America that produced Tylenol and uh, a, a few years ago somebody poisoned some of their product. And they had to react really quickly to this crisis. It was a crisis um, because people were dying. Uh, a number of people died. And they reacted by taking a stance and taking all of their product worldwide off the shelves. Now, some people at the time said, but this is, this is mad because, you know, can we not trace the batch that was poisoned? Can we not trace where that happened, where that, where that, where that started and where that ended up? Um, but they took the view, and this is really important, we'll come on to this in a bit more detail later, but they took the view that the best way to deal with this crisis would be to remove all of, the, all of the product because the crisis very quickly became a crisis of reputational, um, uh, managing their reputation and reputational crisis. And the damage that would do to them later on down the line was greater than the cost of re removing all of the product. So we need to think about how we're going to deal with these things. And it isn't always massive national things. 
we can have situations localized in 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 the winter in in the uk for example you know we have a bit of snow suddenly there's a travel crisis so how are we going to deal with that well you know looking at what's happened now in the pandemic be much better place to deal with any travel crisis if we have snow we have leaves on the trains lines and you know the trains can't move people can't get about the country now as a result of the pandemic that's not going to be such a crisis because people are very much used to working from home used to working in different locations used to working in, in what you might say is isolation um, and that's another issue that we need to deal with as well in terms of thinking about the crisis it's those personal issues mentioned things like psychological first aid well how do we deal with individuals who are going through the crisis so we need to think about that when we bring the, the teams together crisis can also be um, as a result of finance for example you know, we have a crash in the market we lose money that produces a, a crisis that we have to we have to react to so please don't think this is all about massive national disasters um, this is this can be localized for your team for your organization and for yourself as an individual so you may have a personal crisis that you need to deal with so we need to think about who those people that we need to get involved with are so we're going to identify a team the likelihood is we're going to have somebody from operations we're going to definitely need communications because that's a real key skill and a real key tool in working our way out of a crisis we're probably going to need to bring in the, the chief finance officer or the chief operating officer very importantly we're going to need to bring in some outside counsel and these these people are going to be able to bring a different viewpoint a different light to uh to, to what we've got from the crisis Thinking back to the, the problem solving webinar, if any of you saw that, that I did a couple of weeks ago, you know, Einstein said, uh, it's famous for quoting lots of things, but one of the things he said about problems was, you can't solve a problem with the same thinking that created it. So this is really where we want to bring in people from outside to help us see what the crisis is, see a way through it, help us to in, in act our plan that we've, that we've uh, set up in this stage one. So we're going to need some senior managers in there as well. We're going to definitely need HR. We're probably going to need sales and marketing, depending on the type of the crisis. Most people these days will use some form of public relations. So we're going to need uh, somebody there to deal with that. And when we think about public relations, we want somebody who's going to be the voice of the organization. And that's a really, really important thing to think about because that may not necessarily be the person you would initially think. Most people would say, well, in terms of crisis, we need the head of the organization to speak. That's OK if the head of your organization is a good speaker, is a good public communicator, is the right face of the organization for what you want to say. Or do you want to identify somebody else who has more skills, is more eloquent, is more fluid, has a better public persona than necessarily your, your chief operating officer? We're going to definitely need some IT involvement in there. More likely, um, IT will be... Uh, able to identify where the crisis is and deal with it. We're going to need some operations people. We're going to need some product specialists. So thinking about my example around Tylenol, if there's a product that is the cause of the crisis or is subject to the crisis, we're going to need those product specialists there to help us work our way through that. When we're thinking about people who we, we have in these roles and we have um, facing the public, we need to think about the right people with the right skills and get them in the right place. And this is not about hierarchy. This is not about seniority. It may be that the best person to face the public to deal with whatever you need to deal with, or indeed to help us work through this crisis, is further down the chain of command. So don't get stuck in the fact that you know we have to have these six senior people involved to resolve this and nobody else can, can have an input. We need to make sure we've got the right people <coughs> with the right skills in the right place, doing the right things at the right time. So we need to think about all that before we ever engage in a crisis. If we get all these things right, we'll have a really solid plan of how we can how we can cope with any crisis that's thrown at us. We need to build relationships. You know, no man is an island, and we need to think about who who do we need to bring in to help us with this, and who can help us avoid having a crisis in the first place. If this is in your personal life, <coughs> excuse me. If this is in your personal life, we need to think about who are the best people to help you with that. It might be that you have a strong group of friends that you can that you can relate to that can help you through um, critical times. It may be that you need to approach a coach or um, a counsellor of some kind. 
in order to get some support to deal with the crisis that you're going through. In a business sense, we're building relationships with like-minded businesses or businesses that play into our business. And these may be customers, they may be suppliers. We need to build those strong, healthy relationships that will help us deal with a crisis when a crisis occurs. We need to, to, to have a plan. We need to write a plan and we need to monitor that and make sure that it's still relevant as time goes on. The worst thing you can do in a sense is go through all this planning process, have all your teams identified, write it all down, put it in the cupboard, forget about it. You need to get it out, check it. Is it still relevant? Is it relevant in terms of legal changes? Is it relevant in terms of environmental, political changes? We can do that pestle analysis. And if you want more about pestle analysis, there's some great resources on Management Direct. But if we think about that pestle analysis or a SWOT analysis, we can say, with those things in mind, does this, does this plan still work? Does this, does this way that we're going to deal with the crisis still work for us? And then we need to practice it. And you'll see this a lot within um, emergency services. Emergency services, for example, will have lots of run-throughs. They'll create scenarios. You know, they'll, they'll uh, mock up uh, a terrible accident or a plane crash or something like that and bring all the agencies in from their relationships that they've built to have a look at this crisis, deal with it, practice it in a safe environment so that once the crisis does hit at some point down the line, they're very much stronger place in which to deal with it. And there's nothing to stop us doing that in terms of business. You know, if we're producing a product, say, and we have a customer that buys that product and relies on that product. So anything that happens to us is going to cause a crisis, not just for us, but for our customers and potentially our suppliers. We can run a scenario where we say, you know, we, we've got a breakdown in the production line. What happens? What do we do? How do we deal with this? Who do we need to tell? Who do we need to inform? Who do we need to bring in? Now, there's been a, a, in some quarters, there's been a, a cultural history, if you like, of keeping a problem quiet. We'll deal with this ourselves. We won't tell our competitors. We won't tell our, our customers and we won't tell our suppliers. We'll just slowly hunker down and we'll deal with it. And when we do that, we're not actually dealing with it. We're not dealing with the problem at all. So we need to bring in other people who are affected by this in order that we can work through the crisis together. And if you're going to do that in real life, do it in a practice scenario. Doing that will build confidence in your supply chain, for example, it will be build confidence in your customers, build confidence in your suppliers, build massive amounts of confidence in your own organisation that you can deal with whatever's likely to come up. And again, if we think about this as a personal crisis, it will help us to deal with uh, any personal crisis that we might have and support our friends and colleagues if they should have a personal crisis as well. We need to understand how we're going to notify people, what are our communication channels. We need to understand when we need to communicate and what we need to communicate. Now, my personal rule with communication is to communicate as much as possible. Communicate, communicate, communicate. And then when you think you've communicated enough, just to make sure, communicate a little bit more. And the reason I always maintain this is because if you leave gaps, people, organisations will fill in the gaps themselves. And if you've got experience of doing this, if you fill in a gap, it's always going to be dark. It's never going to be a positive, uh, a positive stance that you take because that's not how humans work by and large. really difficult to always be positive. So if someone's not telling you something, we go into that mode where we say, why aren't they telling us? What are they trying to hide? And it just gets darker and darker from there. So make sure we communicate with people as much as possible. When we're thinking about communicating, who are we going to communicate with? Who are our key stakeholders? Who are our priority stakeholders? Who do we need to tell first? Who do we need to think about as need to know now everything, those people that need to know tomorrow and those people that need to know later on when we do that, when we do the, the look back and the, and the review and say, this is what happened. This is how we're going to do it. make sure it doesn't happen again. Now we need to tell this group of people. We need to think as well at this stage about how we're going to get out of it. And we need to think about that in our preparation stage, at stage one, as well as in the other stages. If we have no idea how we're going to get out of a crisis, it's very hard to deal with it once we get into it. Because once we're in it, we won't see the wood for the trees. All we will see is crisis, crisis, crisis. We'll go into panic mode if we're not careful. We go into crisis mode and we'll just hunker down and we'll focus on very small things and not be able to see a way out of it. So we need that incorporated into our plan. So we have all these things in place, much easier to deal with when the crisis hits. 
So having said all that, let's think about when the crisis hits. We're now in the thick of it. Stage two, we're in the thick of it. And the key again is don't panic. Don't panic. Whatever you do, if you're going to panic mode, you're going to basic fight and flight mode, survival mode. You won't be able to think. You won't be able to act appropriately. You'll just run around like a headless chicken and it will make things worse. It will get worse in a personal crisis. It will get worse in a business crisis. It will get worse in a global pandemic. If you panic, it's the worst thing you can do. Psychologically and physically, things happen in your brain that stop you from focusing because your key factor when you panic is how do I stay alive? Your body says, I need to pump adrenaline around to keep everything going. I need to pump blood faster to keep everything alive. My function now is keeping this body alive and well. And you can't think about anything else. All your resources are focused on that. So try not to panic whatever you do. Try to stay calm, but not necessarily carry on doing what you're doing. Once you're in a crisis, you need to have a, 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 an amount of breathing space and you need to build this in your plan. You need to have an amount of breathing space where you can stand back and go, okay, what is happening? What do I actually need to deal with? What can I stop dealing with? What can we put to one side for the moment? How do I focus the resources of this organization or my personal resources on solving this crisis? So we're gonna cut out the waste. We're gonna focus on what works. We're gonna focus on the things without panicking. So we've not gone into, we're not going into tunnel vision mode. We're focusing with a clear mind and a clear view on what needs to be done, those important elements. By doing that, we understand at that point, the people that we've identified in our plan as being our resources, our, our help, our external counsel, all of the things that we talked about in the planning stage, we can bring them in and help us enact our plan. We can bring them in appropriately, and we're not saying, help, 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 everybody come and help me. We're saying, right, this moment in time, I need you. In two days' time, I'm going to need you. In a half an hour after you get here, I'm going to need these three people to turn up to help me solve these problems. So we've got that all in our plan. We have an action plan. We have monitored it. We've kept it up to date. We've kept it fresh. We know that we're not going to do anything that's now illegal or immoral or anything that's changed in that pestle analysis that we keep doing on our plan. So we've got all that in place and we can, we can act on it. We can deal with it appropriately. By doing this, we've got a solid base in which we can manage our way through the crisis and manage our way to a position where we can see light at the end of that tunnel and see a way through it. Helping us do that, or doing that, helps us recognize the problem. And when we bring in our stakeholders, we can see the problem from other people's point of view. Now, this is really, really important because sometimes what we think of as a problem, not necessarily on the level of a crisis, but what we think of as a problem, or if it's a personal crisis, we can get somebody else to look at it and somebody else will say, I don't understand what your problem is there. I don't understand why you think that's a problem. That isn't a problem. And sometimes it can just be uncomfortable if it's a personal issue, but it's not necessarily a problem. Sometimes what we think of as an organizational crisis can actually turn out to be an opportunity. I'm reading a book recently about the Fens here in East Anglia, where, where I'm based. Uh, and the fens used to flood on a regular basis, and people used to think this is terrible. You know, this oh, this this floods regularly, and it, it's a nightmare. But what they discovered was, as part of the flooding from the sea, when the sea uh, withdrew and the land was left unflooded again, um, the nutrients that the sea left behind were fantastic. They're fantastic for agriculture. They're fantastic for grazing. We all we all know there's premium on salt marsh grazed land, for example. Think about the land that comes from Romney Marshes in Kent. Um, you know, it, it, it carries a higher price because the land gets flooded and it, it grazes on, on this land. So there's always an opportunity to see a bright side from this. We think about our current pandemic. You know, lots of people are saying environmentally, there are positives from this because people are flying less, people are driving around less. Um, you know, people are, 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 spaces are being rewilded um, because of this. So there's, it's a terrible, terrible thing we're in, but at least there's, you can see a positive side to it. So we're in this now. We're, we've done our stakeholder analysis. Our stakeholders have come in and looked at it and said, you know, I think you need to do this. So we need to think about our response and we're starting to think about that response. And one way to think about our response is to, to run an ethical test. And when I talk about the ethical test, what I'm thinking about here is three questions. Would you want your friends and family to know about this response, the way you're responding to this. How does it feel in your gut 
Does it feel like you're doing the right things? And the third and final test is, if this turned up on the front page of the newspaper tomorrow, how would you feel? Now, if you can answer all of those positively, you know you're doing the right things. And it's a really good opportunity before you react, especially in a crisis, to run that test through and think, would I be happy if my, my family saw this? Would I be happy if it was on the paper tomorrow? Can I defend it? And does it actually feel right? So once we've done with that, we identify our spokesperson. And again, remember, it's not about hierarchy. It's about the best person to do this. We're assigning tasks to them and to the crisis team, to the CFO, the CEO, IT, PR, HR. Everybody's got a task that they're responsible for. And we have to look at people and say, if you're not helping solve the problem, get out of the way because you're just here as chaff and we don't want you at the moment. You're a valuable member of the team, but not today. Go away. We don't need you. So focus on those people that can help you. Focus on the tasks that you need to, to solve. And when we're thinking about that public voice, we need to issue a statement as soon as possible. And this is, this is really important. And this is critical in terms of how you manage your reputation and how you come out of this crisis further down the line. It is vital that you're honest. And if, it, if you're responsible, take the mea culpa. Stand up and say, you know, we are in this position because of something I have done. I am not going to resign now because I'm going to help people to resolve this situation and work our way out of this crisis. And then I will talk to the people that I need to talk to and review the situation and we'll make a decision on whether that the whether this has been so big that I can't stay. Now, you wouldn't necessarily say that probably, but that's what you need to do in your stakeholder analysis and your, your counsel that you get from other people. And most important in all things, and I think in life in general, is don't lie. If you lie, it will come back and bite you. If you try to spin this, it will come back and bite you. People are not stupid. People will see what you're trying to do and shift the blame and it will come back and it will bite you. And one of the things that you need to think about when you're, when you're dealing with a crisis and how you're reacting to it is what is my overall impact here? How long is the shadow from this? So if I react now, this is what you need to think about when you're planning and getting other people in to look at it. The key here is, is my reaction appropriate to the crisis? Or is my reaction going to cause a bigger problem than the crisis itself? And we can think about that in terms of problem solving all the way up to dealing with a crisis. Is what I'm going to do going to have a bigger effect than the current situation? And if it is, you need to think again. You know, we need to react quickly, but sometimes the quickness of the reaction is just about communicating. We know we've got a problem. We are dealing with it. We're going to tell you how that's going as soon as we can. That gives you a bit of breathing space. Hold people at bay. Deal with what you've got to deal with. Look at your plan, enact your plan, come to a solution, start to work it through. Make sure it doesn't have a bigger effect than the problem itself. So then we get to stage three. We've got, we've had our plan, we've enacted our plan. It's all worked well or it hasn't worked well, but we're at the end of the crisis and we look at the consequences of that and we think, okay, what went well, what didn't? Did we actually deal with the crisis or did we push the crisis somewhere else? Did we come up with a solution that was so big, so costly, it caused more problems than the crisis itself. We can also start to look at what happened, why it happened, can we prevent it happening again in the future? Now, this isn't a blame game. This is about identifying where the problem happened, why the problem happened. We can think about who was responsible for the problem. We might want to deal with training, we might want to deal with um, developing that person, or we might need to get rid of them. Now, there could be criminal implications, there could be legal implications to a crisis as well. So we need to think about that. But we're not saying, this is your fault. If you go, the crisis will never happen again, because clearly that's nonsense, and that's not where anybody believes. Sadly, though, that is what tends to happen in, in certain cultures and certain areas. We need to finalise our message, adapt the key messages, and, and no BS here. I, I'm not going to apologise for being that crude, because I think it's really important. We need to be honest with our messages. Our final message is, this is what happened. We've identified why it happened. We've put measures in place to make sure it doesn't happen again. And this is the way we're going to go forward. And we've got monitoring in place and we've got the people in place. Everything that happened, be honest, your reputation depends upon it. If you survive this crisis as an organisation, your reputation will depend upon how honest you are, how clear and transparent you are with your customers, your stakeholders and your suppliers and the public in general. 
go back to your crisis list, go back to your potential crisis list, think, right, what, what else could happen as a result of this? Are there things that we didn't anticipate when we put this list together, when we put our plan together, that given hindsight, we now recognise could happen? Go back to it, refresh it, make sure that your planning process is up to date, refresh everything you've done, um, review what happened, update your plan as appropriate, right, and keep looking and working through that. So some top takeaways really that I want, I want to leave you with before we, we, we pick up on any questions. As with so many things in life, preparation is the key. If you're prepared and you have a framework in place, so all the things we talked about in stage one, who's going to do what, where they're going to do it, who needs to be involved, who needs to be informed, all of those things, you should be able to adapt to a multitude of crises, different crises. Remember, it's not if it's going to happen, it's, going to, it's when it's going to happen. Now, we don't know exactly, when I say when it's going to happen, we don't know exactly what that crisis may be, but you will definitely be faced with a crisis at some point in your life, at some point in the life of the organisation. So as long as you're prepared for it, it's much easier to deal with. Have an honest assessment of what might happen. Don't spend lots of time planning on things that may not happen. I know um, when um, the law changed a few years ago and people were able to get uh, public information from, from organisations. Um, several councils were, were, were asked what they would do in, in the result of a zombie apocalypse. Now, obviously, you can't plan for that kind of thing because, let's face it, it's pretty, pretty unlikely to happen. And we might as well say it's pretty nonsense, to be honest. But, you know, you can't plan for that sort of thing. But if you've got a framework, you can adapt it should the worst happen. Now, I'm not suggesting that's going to happen, but... You know, a framework will help with all sorts of things. So think about what you, what's likely to happen, what is more realistic that's going to happen. Think about your environment where you live. If you live near an airport, you know, you need to plan for some kind of air crash, for example. If you live near a railway, a big railway terminus, you need to, the, the uh, council and the emergency services need to plan for some kind of crisis with the railways. So it, it will very much depend on, on where you are located and where you operate. As I say, when you, when you are dealing with something, be as honest as you can, communicate, 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 and then communicate some more. And then just in case you haven't communicate again, keep that communication flowing, keep it open, keep it honest. The people that are your customers, suppliers, stakeholders, uh, team, staff, colleagues, are the best people to keep you afloat, but they need to know what's happening. And then finally, take a very honest assessment of what happened. This is not a blame game. We need to understand what happened, why it happened, and how it happened. So if you do all those things, I think you're in a much stronger place to deal with any kind of crisis, whether it be a personal crisis, whether it be a team crisis, an organisation crisis, or a much wider crisis that you're likely to be faced with. So on that note, I'm going to hand you back to uh, Lucia, who I believe has got some questions for us. Thank you, David. Um, first question from the audience is, where do we draw the line when we talk about plans for the worst? I think this is, I think this is a really interesting question. I think I might have touched on it a bit in my, in my last part. I think you need to look at what's realistic um, and think about your environment. Think about the organisation that you work in. Think about what's happening in terms of legal, uh, environmental, ethical issues. Uh, and, and then look at it and say, you know, what is what is likely to happen? What are the consequences if that happens? And what are the consequences of it, of something similar happening? And make sure we've got a plan in place for that. But there are things, you know, if you live in the Lake District, for example, and you, or you live in the middle of nowhere, you live on, on, a, uh, uh, on a farm in, in remote parts of North Norfolk or remote parts of North Yorkshire, the likelihood of having to deal, the local authority having to deal with a train incident is non-existent because there aren't any trains there. You know, you may have aircraft because you've got increased flying from the military, for example. Um, so you may have spillages and environmental issues come out like that. But it really depends on where you're located and uh, the, the type of things that you're likely to be involved with. And also in terms of your organisation as well. So what your organisation does how your organisation operates and functions will give you an idea as to what uh, what you need to do in terms of, of that planning. Okay. 
I run a fitness boot camp and personal service business, currently virtual. We'll be continuing to keep my virtual classes, but now the gym are opening up. I will be doing physical classes again until the second wave. How do I plan for the worst? Uh, this is a, this is a really topical question, isn't it? And I think you plan for the worst by looking at what's already gone. This is where hindsight is a is a really valuable tool, because you know we. I don't believe nobody saw it coming, but we could say nobody saw it coming, so we weren't planned for it. But now we've had that first wave. There are no excuses, really. We need to plan. Look at what we did. Look at what worked well in the first wave for you as an individual business. Look at how you can make uh, make as best of the situation as possible and you're doing that with your technical uh, the technical aspects of it but in terms of planning it's about looking back what worked what didn't work in the first wave and then saying i'm gonna i'm gonna repeat what worked well and ignore what didn't work so well or learn from it but not do it again rather than ignore it how can we develop the habit of having hope in such unprecedented times especially for someone like me who deals with data and believes in actual facts? This is a, this is a really good question. And this is, you know, when we think about personal resilience, this is where personal resilience really comes into key. Um, and matching that with the facts gives you a stronger position, I think, than just optimism. You know, we can say, oh, well, things will turn out for the best. Things will all be all right. We can always look on the bright side of life, as, as Monty Python famously said. Um, but if you're looking at facts, how are you making the most of those facts? And I would suggest that you look at a range of facts and, uh, and this is probably teaching you to suck eggs and I apologize if it is for whoever asked the question, but I would tend to look at a range of facts and see where you can find positive facts out of that. Now there's a, a really good book out at the moment called uh, Factfulness um, by uh, a Swedish writer. His name escapes me, I apologize for that. But that looks at the facts about bright things and the problem we have as people is we're only fed, by and large, negative facts. The news works on negative facts, doesn't work on positive facts. We're, we're always told how bad things are, how bad things are going to be if we don't do this terrible thing that we need to do. So when you're looking at the facts, try and look at the positive side of facts, but use that to help your resilience as well. I know this is likely to happen. What am I going to do personally to deal with it? The facts tell me this is coming up. How can I build my resilience? How can I build my relationships with people to give me a stronger base on which to, to move forward? How can I look at what needs to be done? What are those consequences of not doing anything? What are the consequences of doing X, Y, and Z? And what do the facts tell me about enacting those in order to get out of the situation? How do we know when planning is concrete and robust enough to be actionable, but not too rigid that it becomes unusable when things change as they do, and it would have been a waste of time to put all the planning into place. In other words, what is the sweet spot between proactive and reactive? For me, I think this is where the, the scenarios come in. Run some scenarios, run it through what you're going to do, what happens. You know, if you, when we were all in offices, one thing that I often suggested was switch the power off. Let's just switch the power off. Make sure we're not going to damage anything. You know, we may want to leave the power onto servers. As an example of a crisis, we switch the power off. How are we going to deal with it? What do we do? Everything goes down. Or everybody's computer goes down. Or if you're in a factory, you switch off the power to a, a production line. What happens? How are you going to deal with it? You, know, you can quickly control that. You can control that sort of thing in the terms of workload beforehand and after. You can ha run through that scenario, and that will identify where that sweet spot is. Have we planned enough, or have we overplanned? And actually by switching off and going through that, that program um, of activity, is our plan too big? Are we over planning? Is it overkill? You know, or is it just a case of what will solve this crisis is an electrician with a 13 amp fuse. So we need, to, we need to run through those scenarios, run through those practices, see what's likely to happen. And there will be a whole range of intangibles that we hadn't planned for, we hadn't foreseen, we hadn't even considered on our radar when we were doing the planning. So I, I find personally that's a really good exercise to go through. David, what is your advice for somebody about to take on a full-time role in contingency planning? <laughs> I think this comes back to, to uh, an earlier question, actually. I think 
make sure you have do work on your own personal resilience. Make sure you're looking right. after yourself. Make sure you're looking after your own well-being and mental health in order that you've got a sound basis to deal with with the contingency because it will be exhausting it will be draining for you um make sure you've got the facts and this is where it comes into to the previous question as well make sure you've got the facts what is likely to happen what could happen what is completely off the table that we can take out of the equation um you know what's what equals the zombie apocalypse if you like what's very very not going to happen it's not even go unlikely it's just say not going to happen so we can take all these things off the table but the key really when dealing with all that sort of thing is to think about your own personal resilience have i got what i need in order that i can give to other people to help solve this crisis how do i deal with this contingency if my life is going to rack and ruin if emotionally i'm not strong if i don't have people around me who i can talk to how am i going to deal with this crisis so we need to make sure it doesn't become a personal crisis through working in a in situation like emergency services, contingency planning, all those kind of high stress areas. So for me, it comes back to that. It's almost not in terms of crisis management, it's back to personal management and resilience and how we deal with, how we prepare ourselves to deal with all those things. The worst has arrived. I'm jobless and the competition is very high. How can I expect for the best now when the country is going through a recession? Well, this is this again is a thank you for this. This is a really topical question, whoever asked this. And I think it's a number of things here. I think um, and, and these things are, let, let's face it, when you're in a situation like you're in, these things are easier said than done. And they take a lot of strength and they take a lot of energy. But I would I would look to your look to your support groups, whether that be friends, family, colleagues. Think about your network. Can you build your network? Because very often it's not what you know, it's who you know. And I know we're told that as children all the time, but actually it's true. You know, there may be somebody who you know who can help you get a foot in the door. Think about think about offloading any baggage you may have from your old job. Think about how you're going to put that down because the worst thing you can do if you've lost your job and it's been really, really uncomfortable. The organization's closed you may be on minimum redundancy i don't know what your situation is um but whatever it is see it try to put that aside because if you don't you'll carry that into the next interview and it will come out of you it, it will leak and it will come across as very negative so try to get rid of those things think about your network think about where you can use that think about how, what do you want from the future this is an opportunity as well to stop and say okay do i want to go back into the same kind of thing and thinking about our crisis management, we can use those skills from that framework to say, okay, what are the consequences if I go back into this kind of area? And if I'm going into a, uh, if I'm working in a, um, a an operational sphere where it's it's dying, so this this uh, the, the organisation I'm working for has shrunk, it's maybe stopped working. Do I go into another organisation that's doing the same thing? And if I do, is the consequence that in six months' time I'm going to be out of a job again? So is this an opportunity for me to refocus, re-look at what I want to do, what my skills are, how I can use those in other ways in order to work through this crisis and be in a stronger position at the end of it? So you could almost say, as terrible as it is, and I really feel for you, you could almost say that I'm going to treat this as, a, as an opportunity to do something else in a different environment, uh, in a different way, that will make me stronger in the long run and will give me a stronger base to go forward in, in, in the longer run as well. Now, I will go back to what I said earlier. You know, I do feel your pain. I've been made redundant myself a couple of times in my in my working career, and it's not nice, and it's a bit of a shock. But there's always another side of it that one door closes and another one will eventually open for you. These things are easier said than done, and I really wish you well in your in your search for a new job. Thank you, David. David is asking, can you share any ways you've found to help others overcome their denial of a looming crisis? I think, um, thank you, David. I think this is um, this is where communication comes in, you know, thinking about the consequences. So we can we can be in denial, <clears throat> but what is the consequence of denial? What is that uh, we can do nothing, we can choose to do nothing. Uh, what is the consequence of that? And let's talk through the scenario of that happening. That we just ignore it it's not going to go away um 
you know, if we bury our head in the sand, we are we are incredibly vulnerable to attack from everywhere. So we need to be we need to try and help people see the consequence of denial, see the consequence of doing nothing, see the consequence of not planning. Um, and it's really, you know, somebody mentioned earlier the sweet spot. This is really the, uh, another sweet spot where we're thinking about doing that in a positive way rather than scaring people. We don't want to be thinking, um, you know, if you if you deny this, if you ignore this, this is going to be absolutely horrendous. We don't want to think about that because that's too much for people to cope with. But equally, denial is, is, so you want to find somewhere in the middle of that. So it's about talking about the consequence. What could be the possible consequence of this happening? If you're talking to individuals, I would tend to take a coaching approach. You know, so what do you think could happen? Not this is what's going to happen. What do you think could happen? What would be the worst situation for you if this happened? Because if you make it personal, people start to take more notice of it. Thank you. So what's your view of the importance of resilience inside the crisis? Do you think it possible to work out individual's level of resilience in the planning stage? I think working out their levels of resilience, I think, is a, is a, is a difficult task. And I think that will vary from person to person and from crisis to crisis, depending how it affects that person. But I think what you can do is you can look as an organisation or an individual how you can build resilience, how you can help people understand the things that make them more resilient and build that into your your activities in work. You know, allow for that. Sometimes these things are, are seen as unnecessary soft skills and people say, I'm not going to spend the money on that. That's, you know, how is that helping my bottom line? Well, it might not be helping your bottom line today, but at some point that very much will. Now, whether that means people are resilient to small issues or helping resilience in a crisis, we will only know at that time. But I think the thing is, if you if you invest in resilience for individuals, you're much better placed to deal with the situation. Now, if you're in a situation and you find that the people that you've identified to, to take part in that crisis team, to help you manage a way out of that, are not demonstrating the resilience that they need, you need to be strong enough to be able to say, OK, look, this is really not working for you. I can see this is adding to the problem, actually. So we're going to take you out of this. We're going to bench you for a little while and we're going to bring in somebody else who can help us with this, who's a better place to deal with this. Um, you can tap in and out as you feel strong enough and able to help with. But we may have to bring in another person from the organisation. We may have to bring in somebody from another team, somebody from another, uh, somebody from another organisation or another service that can help us with that. So it's about two things, it's about investing in resilience and it's about identifying when people are struggling and not adding to their pressure if you can do something about it. Now, again, these things are always easier said than done and sometimes you can't do anything about it. But if you can, I would recommend that you do step in, bench people, bring someone else in for a short time um, to get you past the, the, the roadblock you've got and help you to, 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 to work a way out of things. And then let them go. Thank you, David. This was the last question for today. Thank you to everyone who participated and joined us. If you're a member of CMI, you can access Management Direct, which has a whole range of practical resources to help you apply your learnings from today. For anyone new to CMI or those who haven't heard of Management Direct portal, it's full of personal and professional development opportunities, including over 400 videos, 10,000 journal articles, 5,000 5, e-books and more. You can get 10% off your first year's membership to CMI by using the, summer code, the, the promo code SUMMER10. You can also sign up to the free CMI newsletter. Thank you, everyone, again. Thank you, David, for your insight and expertise, and enjoy the rest of the day. Thanks, Lucia. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.